right. Well, thanks you, thank you everyone for joining us this morning. This is our fifth and last study on God's what is God's will for your life. Today we are going to just bring everything together that we've learned from the last four weeks and bring it together in a conclusion. Basically show you the scriptures uh, now that we've gotten rid of, hopefully gotten rid of the thinking that churchianity puts on us about looking for the peace, praying for peace about a decision or looking for a burning in the bosom or looking at the guidepost of life or looking at circumstances to confirm what you believe is God's will. We've gotten past that and we've learned that God treats us like adults, that He has given us His Word, His completed, perfect Word. He's given us His Holy Spirit. And He's... Um, so we've got God's Word. We've got God within us to teach us His Word. And then we've got the mind of Christ to apply the Word. And really, you've got the entire Godhead working with you just reading and believing and applying the Bible. So, what more do you need from God? Why would you look for circumstances when Satan is the God of this world and he has the world operating by his course? If we've got God's word, God working through us to understand it, the mind of Christ to apply it, what more do we need from God? And so we're going to go over, we're going to do our conclusion today just based upon the knowledge that we've gained over the last four weeks and we're going to put that all together, um, looking at the different verses. Um, did did want to... So, so I, I guess we'll just go ahead and go in to that. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. We will be looking at a lot of verses today. And this is just a, a basically the basic statement here. When people ask the question, what is God's will for my life? A lot of times they they pray and they seek for God to speak to them. And then they confirm that that's really God speaking to them by putting out a fleece or looking for circumstances that are in line with what they're already thinking or look for people like a pastor or people in a church to teach them that this is what uh, God would have you to do because God confirmed it to me. You know, I, you prayed about it and you decided what God wanted you to do. You told me, so then I prayed about it and I felt a peace from God that this is what God wanted you to do. Um, and what they're doing is they're, they're forgetting the foundation. You know, over in... in Ephesians 2, in Ephesians 2 and verse 20, talking about the foundation of God's house. God is building a holy temple in the Lord, it says here in Ephesians 2. And we are part of that. And it says in Ephesians 2.20, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, which means built upon the foundation of God's word. You look over in Ephesians 4, in Ephesians 4 and verse 11, when it talks about the gifts that God gave to, that Christ gave to the body of Christ, it says and these gifts are given until God's word is completed. You see there in verse 11 in Ephesians 4, it says he gave some apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Those apostles are the ones who were sent, the sent ones, those who were called by God to go out to certain areas and proclaim the mystery doctrine and mystery gospel. And then the prophets, a prophet is someone who says, Thus saith the Lord. So they're saying, This is what God's word is to us today. So going back to Ephesians 2 and verse 20, when it says, And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. What that tells you is the temple that God is building today, the church, the body of Christ, that he is building in heavenly places today. We are built upon the foundation of the apostles. Those are ones who are sent by God to give the, the doctrine here, because before God's word is completed. And then the prophets proclaim God's word. So what that tells you when it says built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. See, a lot of times people think of that as Old Testament. Well, it's true, Israel does have prophets in the Old Testament. 
And they do have apostles, the 12 apostles that, that Jesus called in, in the book of Matthew there. But those are their apostles and their prophets for the prophecy program. When you're in Ephesians 2, we're talking about the dispensation of grace. And the holy temple that is being built is a reference to the church, the body of Christ. And so we have our own apostles and prophets. Now, now that the word of God is completed, those have passed off the scene. Ephesians 4, when we read verse 11, where it said he gave some apostles and some prophets, verse 13 says, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And then verse 14 tells you a little bit more about the, the will of God. It says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him and all things, which is the head, even Christ. So we grow up in him. And the way we do that is we're not tossed to and fro like children, but we're adults in our understanding. We're not tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. So you have false doctrine, and then you have slight of men and cunning craftiness. So you have false doctrine, and you have false teachers. But if you have the word of God built up in your inner man, then you're not tossed to and fro by people who teach false doctrine. You're like a tree planted by the rivers of water, as Psalm 1 says, because you're in the Word of God. And then when the false teacher comes along and uses sleight of men and cunning craftiness to deceive you, you've already got the truth and you're grounded in it, and so then you will walk in that, and so then it says, verse 15, speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. That right there is telling you what the will of God is for you. It's that you get that sound doctrine in the inner man, and you use the mind of Christ to operate in that doctrine, and when you do that, then you speak the truth in love. If, you have, if you're tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine, then you are speaking falsehoods because you're speaking false doctrine instead of truth. And then there isn't love, because God's love comes through uh, the truth as you apply it. So that's God's will for you. But back in Ephesians 2, you can see there, it says that that temple that God is building in heavenly places, it says in Ephesians 2.20, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. So for us, since God's word is completed, the foundation of the apostles and prophets is the sound doctrine that is in Romans through Philemon. Because the apostles and prophets, in Ephesians 4, was given to the body of Christ to give us that doctrine. But now that we've come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, we've come into the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God by having a completed Bible. So since we have a completed Bible then, then we don't have people who are called to be apostles of God today or called to be prophets. We can simply read and believe God's Word and the Holy Ghost teaches that to us directly as we read and believe it. And so it tells us, Ephesians 2.20, that we were built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone. Well, the reason He is the chief cornerstone is He is the Word. John 1 says, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So He is the Word. Paul said in Galatians 1 that the gospel which he preached, he did not receive it of man, neither was he taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 14.37, Paul says that what he speaks are the commandments of the Lord. And so we've got... The apostles and prophets are the sent ones, the apostles. The prophets are proclaiming God's word. And then Jesus Christ is the word. Now, Paul verifies in 1 Corinthians 14 and Galatians 1 that what he has in his epistles are the very words of God. Therefore, that's why it says there in Ephesians 2.20, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. 
And as we read over in Ephesians 4, when we saw the doctrine in verse 14, where no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, then verse 15 says we speak the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. The head, that's another way of saying he is also the chief cornerstone. He's the head of the body or the chief, and also the chief cornerstone of the building that God is building with us. So going back to Ephesians 2, you see in verse 20, foundation of apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ the chief cornerstone, and then verse 21, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth, unto a holy temple in the Lord. Just like we saw in Ephesians 4, verse 15, that when we speak the truth in love, we may grow up into Him in all things. So verse 21 in Ephesians 2 says, the building groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. And now Ephesians 2, 22, Ephesians 2, 22, in whom you also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. So really, all that puts it together for you in a more doctrinal type, theoretical way to tell you that when you read and believe God's Word and then you use the mind of Christ to apply the sound doctrine that's built up in the inner man, then the result is that you are not tossed to and fro like children. You are now adults. So if you're adults, God treats you like an adult. You have, you know, when you're a child, you have all these rules and regulations you have to follow because you don't have the ability to think for yourself. Like you have a, you got to go to bed at maybe say 8 p.m. Well, you don't want to go to bed at 8 p.m. You want to stay up and watch TV. I remember there was an old Cosby show where Rudy, the little girl, wanted to stay up. And the father said, no, you can't stay up. You got to you got to go to bed. And so finally he let her stay up and she stayed up for the late, late, late show and was up till like 2 or 3 in the morning. And uh, he let her do that. Then, But then she had to get up at like 5.30 or 6 a.m. Of course, she's tired and he's dragging her all around the house and forced her to go to school. And then she learned, well, you know, I guess I should go to bed at 8 or 8.30 because I'm not going to be able to function the next day if I only get two or three hours sleep. But as a child, you see, your brain doesn't think that. Your brain thinks, hey, I want to watch TV. I'm going to stay up all night. You're not thinking ahead and thinking uh, there's going to be consequences to that. So then you have to, as a parent, put that rule on there and say, you're going to bed at 8. I don't want to go to bed at 8. It doesn't matter. You're going to bed at 8. That's the rule. I'm the adult. You're the child. That's the rule. But see, when you're an adult, you don't have anybody telling you that. You're the one who, and you may stay up late one night for some show you want to watch. Well, then the next day you're suffering the consequences. You're downing a couple extra cups of coffee or trying to stay awake. You know, you can't think as well because you didn't get the sleep you wanted. But you make the decisions for yourself because you're an adult. And you have that ability to look at that long-range, long-term thinking. And that's why God, when it comes to your will, God's will for your life, He doesn't say... Thou shalt move to this city. Thou shalt take this job. Thou shalt marry this person. But he treats you like an adult. So he says that the temple there in Ephesians 2, since we are, build it up together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. So we get the sound doctrine in the inner man. Now we're not tossed to and fro like children, but we are adults. We're mature. The slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive won't affect us because the foundation is apostles, prophets, and then Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. That's the foundation. And as long as that foundation is where you are, then you'll be okay. And that's why I went to that going back to 1 Timothy chapter 2 now because churchianity, they'll tell you, well, you pray and you listen for the still small voice and then if you're at peace about this decision, uh, then you get other, maybe go over it with a pastor or a spiritual leader, someone you respect, have them pray about it, have them seek what the Lord would have you to do. And what they're doing when they do that process is they've gotten away from the foundation. The foundation is apostles, prophets, and Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. Apostles and prophets, 
And Jesus Christ now, and since God's Word is completed, is all found in God's Word. And so that's why I go back here to 1 Timothy 2, 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4. 1 Timothy 2, verse 3 says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will, so that's God's will. You want to know God's will for your life? Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth? That's God's will for your life. And you may say, well, he, God didn't tell me that I should marry this person or that I should get this job or that I should move to this location. Exactly. Just like when you are an adult, you don't have somebody telling you, you have to go to bed at this time. You have to eat a good breakfast and, and get up at this time and eat a good breakfast and here is what you were going to eat. And then you were going to put on these clothes and then you were going to go to this place. See, you don't have that happening because you're an adult. You can make those decisions yourself. So when God gives you the foundation of apostles, prophets, and Jesus Christ, what more do you need? He's already abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. He's given us you know, he, he says in Colossians chapter 1. He says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. Well, let's start in verse 23. Colossians 1.23, he says, If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled. Okay, the faith is sound doctrine. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So the way I continue in the faith is I'm not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, but I'm grounded in God's word. Grounded and settled, it says, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard. Not that I'm looking to keep my salvation, but being moved, not moved away from the hope of the gospel means our hope, the hope of the gospel, Colossians 1 verse 5, Colossians 1 verse 5 says, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. So if I am not, if I am grounded in the faith, grounded and settled, and I'm not moved away from the hope of the gospel, what that means is the hope laid up for me in heaven. The hope laid up for me in heaven not only is eternal life, but it's also the position that I have in the heavenly places. Paul says, I press toward the prize for the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Philippians 3.14, I think. Yeah, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Philippians 3.14. That is the hope laid up for him in heaven. The prize of this is the position that I'm going to have in heavenly places. And I get that yeah. higher position because I am grounded in the sound doctrine. As Colossians 1.23 says, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for the body's sake, which is the church, Verse 25, Colossians 1.25, Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God or to complete it. God's word is complete once the mystery is completely given. And he says, he expounds upon that in verse 26. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations but now is made manifest to his saints. I mean, think about what churchianity does. They say, I want to know God's will for my life. And I say, well, God's will is for you to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. But then you say, well, I want to know specifically, what job does he want me to take? Where does he want me to live? Well, God treats you like an adult. As a child, you needed to go when to go to bed, when to get up, what to eat, where to go. But as an adult... You don't have anybody commanding you to do these things and punishing you if you don't do them. You, are, you make your own decisions. So you decide what time to go to bed, 
what I'm going to eat in the morning or if I eat anything at all, what time I'm getting up, where I'm going. And that's how God is with you. You're an adult now. And look at what God has revealed to you. He's full. Verse 25 says he fulfilled the word of God. Verse 26, he said he did it with a mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. You read Romans 6 through 8 and you find out how, how your life is in Christ. You find out that you are buried with him in baptism, the dry baptism by the Holy Spirit into Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. You understand that you are spiritually circumcised, a circumcision made without hands, Colossians 2.11, cutting off the sins of the flesh. You learn that you have been given the Holy Spirit, given unto you. You've learned you've got God's completed word, that the Holy Ghost can teach you these things, and then you can use the mind of Christ to walk in the Spirit, and you don't have to listen to the lust of the flesh like you used to before you were saved. In those three chapters in Romans 6 through 8, you can learn all about your in Christ life and how to walk in the Spirit as opposed to operating in the lust of the flesh. That is some advanced adult, spiritually adult information that God didn't reveal before then. If you were Isaiah, Jeremiah, one of those people in the Old Testament, they didn't know that they're buried with Christ in baptism and raised with Him in new life. They didn't know that they're spiritually circumcised, circumcision made without hands to cut off the body, the sins of the flesh. They didn't know those things. These things were a mystery that were given by God to the Apostle Paul and then given to us. So God has given us, fulfilled His Word, given us a sound doctrine on how to operate as a spiritual adult, and now you have a bunch of churchianity acting like a bunch of kids. It's like, it's like finally reaching adulthood, and then you want to be like a child again. And the reason is because they won't, don't want to deal with those things. You know, I mentioned as a child, you're told when to go to bed and when to get up and what to eat in the morning and all these things. And, I mean, the child says, well, I don't want to do that. I want to do what I want to do. So there's that part where the child wants to be an adult, but then there's another part of it that the child, yeah, he says he wants to be an adult, but he doesn't want the responsibilities of the adult. You know, because there are a lot of problems you face as an adult. You've got to figure out, you know, what job am I going to take? Where am I going to live? And you've got to figure out, you've got to buy food and clothing and shelter, um, and you've got utility payments and you know, all the car payments, you got all these different bills you got to pay. You got to find a job that will get enough money to pay the bills, but then you also got to take care of family issues, you know, maybe health issues with uh, parents or kids or, you know, you just got a whole host of problems as an adult that you didn't have to deal with as a kid. So, yeah, you want to grow up and be an adult when you're a kid, because you think it's all fancy, you don't understand all these problems. You say, oh yeah, I can do what I want to do. Then my parent, then I can go to bed when I want, and I can get up when I want, and all that. But then you find out when you're an adult that you actually do less of what you want, because now you got all these responsibilities you got to take care of. And that's sort of like what churchianity is. That they're a bunch of kids, they believe the gospel and come to Christ, and now they're saved and they think that's great. But look at all the responsibilities. If God has given us, fulfilled the word of God, and has given us the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, the responsibility is to read God's word every single day and believe it, even though the preacher that I've been going to for the last 30 years teaches something different. Or the TV evangelist or the Christian living book or the guy on the radio, or whoever, or just my own conscience tells me something different. And i got to believe God's Word over that. See, I like, the, the, I like having eternal life and a home in heaven. I like those things. But the responsibility is, God's basically saying, instead of telling you, like what churchianity says, churchianity says that you've got to pray for God's will, and God will secretly reveal to you somehow that you're supposed to take this job or move to this place. And there's a little comfort in that. 
because it's a real easy thing for me to do. I just close my eyes and say the prayer. I wait for this feeling that God is speaking to me. I get it confirmed by somebody else, and then I do it. But if God's treating me like an adult, that's not what an adult does. That's what a child does. As an adult, God says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. A workman who has to study in order to be approved of God. I don't want to do all that. That's a lot of work. You mean I got to think for myself? God isn't magically going to tell me what job to take or who should I marry. I've got to study God's word and figure out if that other person is a good person for me to marry or if that job is a good job for me to take with all these other factors. Um, and a lot of unknowns there, you know... A lot of people don't want to do that. They like the idea of being having a home in heaven, eternal life. But you want me to study and be a workman? Uh, I don't know about that. And see, so that's why churchianity doesn't teach this stuff. Because God's given you the mystery. You want God to speak to you, and He's given you the mystery, which was hid from ages and from generations. He's given you all the tools you need to know how to live the in Christ life. That people in the Old Testament, saints, First Peter says they, they search diligently to find out how the salvation would come. And the Holy Ghost revealed to them and says, I'm not telling you. That's for a later generation to find that out. I'm not telling you. Here we are, after the cross, in the mystery, God's completed word, We've got all things. God has abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. He's given us the mystery that was hid. And here we are complaining that God won't tell us to take this job or marry this person. We've got all this here. We've got, you know, those people like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they'd love to live in this day and age when they've got God's completed word. And they can know all about the in Christ life. They can live by the faith of the Son of God. What a wonderful thing. And we just take it for granted, toss it aside, say, Oh God, please show me who to marry. Please show me what job I'm going to have. God wants you to read His Word. He treats you like an adult. He's giving you all the information you need. Just read it and believe it and make your own adult decisions on this. So Colossians 1, so verse 26 says, Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. So, right there, what you've got is, you want to know God's will? Well, God has revealed the mystery. Verse 25 says, to fulfill the word of God, verse 26, he's giving you the mystery. And so you just read that. When you do that, verse 27 says that God will make known to you the riches of the glory of this mystery. And which is, what is the riches of the glory of the mystery? It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Galatians 2.20. You look at Galatians 2.20. Galatians, you want one verse that tells you God's will for your life other than to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth? You want one verse that tells you? Galatians 2.20. Right here. This is the will of God for you. Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh... I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Basically, God's will is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Living by the faith of the Son of God, not living by your flesh. That's why he said in Colossians, so back in Colossians 1 and verse 5, he said, the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. So he talks about that hope and we saw that that was the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus the position which comes about by learning sound doctrine and applying it 
so that you will now be in a better position to judge angels in heavenly places so you can tell them what they should do because you've got the sound doctrine in the inner man. So that's the hope laid up for you in heaven. Colossians 1.5 then we saw in verse 23, if you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. And then verse 27, he says, the mystery has been given to you so that you may know the riches of the glory of the mystery and the riches of the glory of this mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So the hope laid up for you in heaven, Colossians 1, 5, verse 23 if we continue in the faith grounded and settled, the sound doctrine, if we live by the sound doctrine built up in the inner man, then we're not moved away from that hope. And we find out from verse 27 that the hope of glory is Christ in you. And Christ in you is defined by Galatians 2.20. That I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So, basically, doing God's will is Christ in you. The more you have sound doctrine built up in the inner man, the more you can use the mind of Christ to make decisions so that you live by the faith of the Son of God and you do God's will. You say, but that doesn't tell me what job I should take, what person I should marry, where I should live, or whatever other decision you got out there. And I say, exactly. Because when the word of God is in you, Ephesians 4 says, that ye be henceforth no more tossed about. Well, I'm messing up the quotation. Ephesians 4, 14. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness. God doesn't tell you every single step of what you should do in your life because you're not a child. You're an adult. And if you have sound doctrine built up in the inner man, then you're not tossed to and fro like children. You're an adult, so you can make the decisions. So just like once you're an adult, you don't have to be told what time to go to bed, what time to get up, what to eat in the morning, uh, you know, what to do after that. You know, that the bell rings and that means you go out of this classroom and you got five minutes to get to this other classroom and the bell rings again and it starts. You don't have to worry about uh, following all those rules because you've got Christ in you, the hope of glory. You've got God's completed word. You've got the Holy Ghost to teach it to you and you got the mind of Christ. God is abounded toward you in all wisdom and prudence. You got all that together. You can make your own decisions. Just like when you're an adult, you don't have to be told all those things that you did as a child because you have the maturity of mind to make your own decisions. And that's how God is to you today in the dispensation of grace. It was different in the Old Testament. God told Isaiah for three years to take off all his clothes and go around nude around Israel to show the nakedness and the shame of their sin. If you feel like God's telling you that today, God's not telling you that today. I guarantee it. Because that's not in Romans through Philemon for you to, that's not part of sound doctrine today. God treated Isaiah like a child because he didn't have the mystery information that we have today. So Isaiah had to rely upon that. He told Ezekiel to lay on his side for 360 days and to cook food using human dung. And Ezekiel says, well, that's unclean. He says, okay, you can use cow's dung instead. That was a direct commandment by the Lord to Ezekiel. God has not told us to lay on our side for 360 days and eat food that's cooked over cow's dung, like he did with Ezekiel. That's because we've got the mystery. God doesn't have to tell us step by step what to do. We just use the information that we have and God treats us as adults to make our own decisions. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. So that's why I can't point to you and say, you need to do this job. You need to marry this person. You need to move here. I can't tell you that stuff. Because God's not telling you that stuff. And if you feel like God's telling you when you pray, that's just your own feelings. 
It's your own emotions there. God says, I've given you, abounded toward you in all wisdom and prudence. I've given you the mystery which is hid. Isaiah and Ezekiel didn't have this stuff. So I had to tell them what to do. But you've got all wisdom and prudence. You've got all the information you need. You can grow up listening to the head, getting the sound doctrine in the inner man, allow Christ to live in you, and make your own decisions based upon that information because you've got the information you need. Just like when you're an adult. I don't have to tell you when to go to bed. You've got the information you need to make your own decisions about that. So Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Philippians 2, verse 12. Philippians 2, and verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. People take that verse out of context and say, oh, see there right there? Paul did not teach eternal security. He says you've got to work out your own salvation. You've got to make sure that you keep that salvation by doing the commandments and not getting involved in any really bad sin. That's not what the verse says. It says that you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out. You ever go, you say, I'm going to work out. I'm going to work out my bicep. I'm going to do some curls, work out my bicep. I don't work, I don't do the curls in order to obtain a bicep. I already have the bicep. I'm working it out. If you work it out, you're making it stronger. You're using it to a great, having a greater capacity. So if it says, work out your own salvation, that doesn't mean I'm trying to get my salvation or maintain it. If I'm working it out, I'm using the salvation I already have to make it stronger. Not that you're going to be any more saved, but stronger in the sense of it is used to a greater capacity for the Lord's will. Just like that bicep. I'm not working to obtain the bicep or to keep it. I've got it. It's there. It's part of my arm. But if I work it out, I'm making it stronger. Now I can do more things with that bicep because it's stronger than I could before. So if you're working out your own salvation, you're not doing it to keep it, maintain it. You're doing it to make it strong. You can do more without salvation. You can allow Christ to live in you to a greater capacity. That's what he's saying. He says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. The fear and trembling, again, not that you're going to lose it, but remember, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Look, hold your place. Look at 2 Corinthians 4. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Think of what that, we just say, oh, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And a lot of times we don't stop to think about what does that actually mean. And when you think about it, what it means, that's some powerful stuff there. 1 John says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Satan is pretty powerful. He is the God of this world. If you're the God of this world, you've got a lot of power. But 1 John says that Christ in me is greater than Satan. So he is greater than the power of the world. Jesus says, in this world you have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So if Christ overcame the world, he overcame Satan, which means that the world has absolutely no control over me as long as I allow Christ to live in me. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. Boy, that's some power right there. Can you do that? Can you just speak a word? I know you got electricity and flipping switches, but I mean, apart from that, if you're just in a complete, like, say you're in the bottom of the Grand Canyon and it's completely dark, and you say, well, I wish I could see. I command the light to appear. It won't work. Not going to work. It's still going to be just as dark as before you said that. God spoke. And Genesis 1 said, let there be light. And there was light. God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So commanding the on the first day of creation when he said, let there be light, that was some power. Power we don't have. God had that power to change dark to light. 
And he says, he's done that, but he's also shining our hearts before we were saved, dark hearts, dead in trespasses and sins. He is shining our hearts to give us the knowledge of the glory of God and the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Christ in you, the hope of glory, is far and above <coughs> the most powerful thing in the entire universe. There is nothing more powerful than Christ in you, the hope of glory. Yes, I could say in the middle of the Grand Canyon in darkness, let there be light, and it doesn't work. Ephesians 6 says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The power in me isn't to do some magic trick, to turn darkness into light, or to make a million dollars appear in my hand, or to heal somebody physically. That's not it. The power is spiritually speaking. Satan is stronger than me in my flesh. There is nothing I can do against him. But Ephesians 6 says, if I use the sword of the Spirit, I'm able to defeat Satan every single time. That's Christ in me. Christ in me, the hope of glory, is the most powerful thing this world has ever seen. Or, you know, the entire universe. Most powerful thing. So going back to Philippians 2. That's why he says at the end of verse 12, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It's a type of reverence thing. It's not, oh, I'm afraid I'm going to lose my salvation. It's not what he's talking about. You've got the most powerful thing ever in existence, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You should have some reverence for that. You should read God's word and believe it and allow Christ to live in you. If you had the power to just create a million dollars to appear, to pay off all your bills, have no debt, have a house paid off, car paid off, I think all of us would use that power. We've got something even more powerful, spiritual power within us. Christ in me, the hope of glory. We should have fear and trembling over that, reverence it. Again, not, not worrying about losing my salvation. Christ has already overcome that. He's already given me, the blood of Christ has already forgiven me of all my sins. The fear and trembling is the reverence over what God, through Christ, does in my life. That's why it says in verse 13, Philippians 2.13, you can see him building on that. Work out your own salvation, fear and trembling. Verse 13, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God's will in my life. What is that? Christ in me, the hope of glory. It's the sound doctrine in the inner man. But see, in order for you to recognize that, you have to walk by faith and not by sight. But what does churchianity do? They walk by sight and not by faith. So they'll pray and they'll say, oh, well, I felt God leading me this way and I'll do that. That's walking by sight. But if I walk by faith, I get the sound doctrine in my inner man. Well, God is leading me to take this job. Well, how do you know? Well, God didn't speak to me. It's just I recognize putting together all the sound doctrine that I have in my life, in my inner man, that this would be the best decision for me to make out of the available jobs. Well, that doesn't sound too spiritual, but really... That's Christ in me, making that decision. Now, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to be arrogant enough to say, God said I should take this job because perhaps my flesh was involved and I did not make the decision based upon God's word. But really, that's the more accurate way of doing God's will. If I work out my own salvation with fear and trembling, verse 13, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. The treasure and earthen vessels there. Verse 14, do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Remember 2 Corinthians 4, God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined into our hearts the knowledge of, uh, Jesus, uh, of God in the face of Jesus Christ. If he shined that light in us, then when we make decisions based upon sound doctrine, then we are as shine as lights in the world. Verse 16 tells you that. 
holding forth the word of life. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. I've got God's word in my heart. The knowledge of God has shined into my heart, the light of the knowledge of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And then if I make decisions based upon that, that's Christ living in me. And then what I've done is, and I am shining as lights in the world, spiritual lights then, by, verse 16, holding forth the word of life. I'm holding forth the word of life by making decisions based upon that sound doctrine in the inner man. Christ is living in me, the hope of glory, the light of Jesus Christ shining through me. So holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. The day of Christ is a reference to 1 Corinthians 3, the judgment seat of Christ. Where in that day, he's going to judge your works. If they're wood, hay, or stubble of the flesh, is what that means, they're going to be burned, and you don't get a reward. If your works are gold, silver, precious stones, that's the in Christ life. And then you are rewarded with a position in heavenly places. So if I, as it says there in verse, four, uh, verse 15, if I am the Son of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom he shine his lights in the world, meaning if I get the sound doctrine in my inner man, make decisions based upon that doctrine, then I'm holding forth, verse 16, the word of life. So what I'm doing is I'm working gold, silver, precious stones. Therefore, I am going to rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. So, if I hold forth the word of life, allow Christ to live in me, then I'm going to rejoice in the day of Christ because when my works are tried at that judgment seat of Christ, they're not going to be wood, hay, and stubble. They're not going to burn. They're going to survive the fire. So basically, your works go in the fire to see what kind of reward you get. If all I did was my flesh, I did not base it upon sound doctrine. I followed false doctrine. The slight of men and cunning craftiness got me. Then the works go through the fire. They don't come out on the other end. They're all burned up. Well, I'm not going to rejoice over that because I didn't get a position. I still have eternal life because that's based upon the blood of Christ. But I didn't get my position in heavenly places because I didn't allow Christ to live in me. But if I have shined as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, then when my works go through that fire, it comes out on the other end, gold, silver, precious stones, I've got a reward in heavenly places, so I rejoice. Something good came out of it. That's why I rejoice. And I know that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain, because everything was based upon sound doctrine rather than following my own flesh. Go over to uh, Ephesians chapter 2. We were over there earlier. But I want you to see... Uh, earlier part of that chapter, earlier in the verse there, and then the chapter, Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, let's start in verse 4. Ephesians 2 verse 4. Talking about when we were saved here, it says, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, that was when you were saved, when you believed the gospel, this is what happened to you. Even when we, when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that's the position that God has planned for you in heavenly places for all eternity. Because it says, from that position in heavenly places, verse 7, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. So when you're saved, God says, okay, you're saved, seated together with Christ in heavenly places. Now Christ has got a position for you in the heavenly places. And in the ages to come, I'm going to show the exceeding riches of my grace to you through Christ Jesus as a result of the position that you have in heavenly places. The higher the position, the greater the riches that are going to be shown through you. But 
what position are you going to have? Well, that's going to depend on this next part here. Verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And now verse 10, verse 10, After you are saved, you are seated together with Christ in heavenly places. Now Christ as the head, the more you listen to Christ as the head, the more sound doctrine you have built up in your inner man, then the greater that position is going to be. So what do you do? How do you fulfill God's will? It's by Christ living in you. See in verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. So I'm in Christ Jesus. I'm created to fill this position. As Paul said in Philippians 3, 14, I press toward the prize for the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So Christ has set this bar for me to get to in terms of sound doctrine in my inner man and allowing Christ to live in me. And as long as I do that, then I'm pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I'm going toward that position that Christ Jesus would have me fulfill, to have in heavenly places. If I don't do that, if I use my free will to just operate in the lust of my flesh, I'm not pressing toward the prize. I'm going away from it. You know, just like a marathon, if you run a marathon, I did that years ago, I assume it's the same way now, but you run the marathon 26.2 miles, you get to the end, they give you a medal. Everybody gets a medal. If you finish, you get a medal. Now, the top ones get a lot more. The LA Marathon, I think they gave away $100,000 in a new car to the person who finishes in first. Their prize is a lot better. Well, that's because they did a lot more training than I did. I took five hours to finish it. They did it in two hours and 15 minutes. They did a lot better job in the marathon. They got a lot better prize. I still got a medal, but they got the bigger prize. For you, God says you're saved. Here's the medal. Eternal life. Seated together with Christ in heavenly places. You've got it. Well, what's my position? Is it a throne, principality, power, might, dominion? What is it? I don't know. How are you going to finish? Are you going to allow Christ to live in you? Or are you going to do your own thing? If you do your own thing, well, you got the medal. You're in every name that is named. But if you allow Christ to live in you, maybe you get a power. Maybe you get a principality. Maybe you get a might. Maybe you get a dominion. The more Christ lived in you, the more, the greater the position. And you see there in verse 10, Ephesians 2.10, since we are his workmanship, we're created in Christ Jesus, then it's all about Christ living in you. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Interesting term, walk in them. Because in our fleshly mind, what we would think is, oh, Christ died for me, the least I could do is live for him. You would think in your fleshly mind, I'm going to do these good works for God. I'm going to take this missionary position or be this pastor or I'm going to be the worship leader or I'm going to do this great sacrifice for God. I, 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 I. I am going to do these things. But it doesn't say good works for we to do, for us to do. It says we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Walk in them. In other words, we don't do them. Christ does them in us is the point. God has abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. He's given us the mystery. And so he says, here's my completed book. Get that sound doctrine in the inner man and then make the decisions based upon that. And then that's Christ living in you. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm not living. I'm crucified. Christ is living in me. It's not me living. It's the faith of the Son of God. So the good works, it's not me doing them. It's me walking in them. It's Christ doing them through me. Romans 12, 1 says, Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You want to do the will of God? 
God says the reasonable service that you are to do is to present your body as a living sacrifice and allow Christ to do the works through you. Therefore, Ephesians 2.10 does not say that I do the good works. It says I walk in them. Christ does them through me. I just walk in them. I'm going along with where Christ wants me to go. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, the next couple of passages, what I want to share with you is basically showing that doing God's will is not some big thing in the eyes of men, usually. Um, you know, because when you, when you go to a church and you say, I want to do God's will, a lot of times you think that you are only doing what God wants you to do if you are somehow in the ministry, that you are, you become a missionary, or you become a pastor, or you become a worship leader, or maybe you're the treasurer of the, of the church. You're doing something for the church. So then you think, oh, I'm really serving God. I'm not just coming every Sunday, but I'm doing some kind of service in the church. And it's like we have to glamorize it. You know, that person who is the pastor or the person who is a missionary must be much more godly or much more spiritual than this other person I know who just works a nine-to-five job at some factory. That's the idea that churchianity puts out there. But really, these next couple of verses, what they're going to show is doing God's will is simply Christ living in you. It's just simply making those decisions based upon sound doctrine. And if, if you've got, say, you know, a wife and two kids, and uh, God says, in, well, you're in 1 Thessalonians. Did I tell you to get that? Mm -hmm. Chapter 5. Um, I'm sorry. Whole 1 Thessalonians. Look at Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 8 says, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. So here's the so what would God have? Okay, here's the husband. He's got a wife and two kids. Uh, according to this verse, that husband does God's will. Just by doing that 9-to-5 job in a factory, making enough money to pay the bills and to take care of his wife and the two kids. If he was to say, quit his job, and I'm just going to live for the Lord, I'm just going to go wherever God wants me to go. And so I'm just going to go around as a vagabond preaching God's word out to people. That sounds like it's more spiritual, like God has called me to a street preaching ministry. And it sounds good, like, oh, oh, he's real spiritual, oh, he's real godly, to give up these worldly things. So it sounds good, but really, the boring 9-to-5 factory job was more God's will than being the street preacher quitting the job, because God says, you've got to take care of your family first. If you don't do that, you've denied the faith. So while it looks like the street preacher is really doing God's will, the guy in the factory that you never hear about that churchianity won't glamorize, is actually doing God's will better than the person who quit his job and is not taking care of his family because he's just living on faith. Oh, I'm living by faith, brother. God's going to take care of me. No, you're not. You denied the faith, and you're worse than an infidel, according to 1 Timothy 5.8. So what I wanted you to see now is a couple of verses which show you basically that God's will is really for you to lead a boring life. Now, I'm not going to say, I'm not saying that you have to have a boring job and that everything you do is boring. I don't mean it in that respect. But when I say boring life, it means that really, for the most part, God just wants you to live an everyday life. You get up, you do a, work, a job, you make the money that you need to take care of your family, you read God's Word, and you make decisions as you go through life based upon God's Word. I mean, that in in the world's view, is a boring life. Because I'm not a rock star. I'm not a celebrity. I'm not a, a professional athlete. Or spiritually speaking, I didn't, go to, uh, I didn't go to China as a missionary. Or I didn't become a pastor or a big uh, somebody who is known in the Christian community. 
didn't do those things. God just wants you to do your everyday life and then get God's word in you and make decisions based upon everyday life because God is in those things. God is wanting people to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. The majority of the people are living a, you know, I work every day, I do normal everyday activities, and, and then if you make decisions based in your normal life based upon God's word, as opposed to based upon what the world says, that that's Christ in you, the hope of glory, then other people can see that, and then they can be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth as well. So 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 11 and verse 12. 1 Thessalonians 4, 11. And that ye study to be quiet, and to do your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that ye may walk honestly toward them that are without, meaning outside of the church, and that ye may have lack of nothing. That's God's will for you. I mean, there, granted, there are people who are the missionaries and there are the pastors and those positions like that. But for the most part, most people aren't going to fall into that category. And it doesn't mean you're not in God's will or you're not super spiritual if you're not doing a position in a church. God's will is simply you study to be quiet, do your own business, work with your own hands. And when you do that, you walk honestly toward them that are without, have lack of nothing, you're doing God's will right there. Sounds like just an ordinary thing, uh, and that's what it is. You, in heavenly places, you'll have a lot of extraordinary stuff there. I mean, I think we'll be able to fly around, travel, you know, go through different dimensions, um, you know, do all kinds of extraordinary stuff in the spirit realm. But we're on earth right now. Our goal isn't to do that. When Jesus Christ came on this earth, yes, he did the miracles. But his goal wasn't to make, it wasn't a horse and pony show, dog and pony show, to try to make everybody say, ooh, ah, look at that. It was all about, he says, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Christ came to seek and save that which was lost. It's not a glamorous thing going to the cross. It's just what God called him to do to get the job done. And that's what you're supposed to do. You simply read and believe God's word, make decisions based upon the sound doctrine. No one may ever know who you are. You're just an ordinary, boring person in the eyes of the world. But for God, Christ's light is shining through you to others, holding forth the word of life in a lost and dark world. Um... Philippians chapter 4. Look at Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. Philippians 4, 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. He has learned this because he's allowed Christ to live in him. If you don't allow Christ to live in you and you're operating by the flesh, then you're always striving over something. Oh, I wish I had enough money. I wish I could win the lotto and then I could pay off my bills and all my problems would be solved. Really? Have you ever heard interviews of people who have won the lotto? I think like three-fourths of them go bankrupt within a year or two. They have more problems, and they'll say probably five years down the road, I wish I never won the lotto. You think money's going to solve all your problems? It just creates more problems. So he says, I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. See, bad or good, abased, I'm just dirt poor. I have nothing. I've learned how to have Christ living in me when I'm dirt poor. But I know how to abound. I know how to allow Christ to live in me when everything's going good in this world. He says, Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. 
I can do all things through Christ. Those two words need to be underlined. Through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Sound doctrine in the inner man. I can allow Christ to live in me in every situation. So basically, God says, that's what you need to do. So, <coughs> excuse me. You may be rich, you may be poor. You may be full, you may be hungry. You may be abound, you may suffer need. Whatever it is, just be content. Allow Christ to live in you. Yet not I, but Christ. When Christ had money in this world, he gave it over to Judas. The thief, he knew Judas was stealing the money. He didn't care. He says, I don't want to be involved in the love of money. I don't want that temptation. So I'm just going to give it over to the thief. I'll let him steal it. Then I don't have to worry about being diverted away from my father's will. And he says, foxes have holds, birds have nests, but the Son of Man hath not a place to lay his head. That's fine. He's learned to be content wherever he is. He allows the sound doctrine in the inner man to work through him. So a closing verse for us, Matthew chapter 5. We'll be done. Matthew chapter 5. What, how do you do God's will? What is God's will for your life? Matthew chapter 5. Verse 16. Matthew 5, verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Okay, what's the light? We already heard Christ is the light. That God has shined in our hearts in the knowledge of God through the face of Jesus Christ. In the face of Jesus Christ, He is the Word. So when I get God's Word in my life, I believe it, and I'm using the mind of Christ to, um, based upon that sound doctrine, make decisions based upon the sound doctrine, I'm using the mind of Christ. So then the light of Christ is shining before men when I do that. And then they see my good works, which is the good works that God hath ordained for me to walk in. Which again, doesn't mean that, oh, I planted a church here, or I grew a church from 10 people to 1,000 people, or I became this missionary and 1,000 people were saved. It doesn't have to be that. It could be simply, I went to work every day. I did just an average job. I didn't hate it. I didn't love it. I just did it. And I made a decent living. And I took care of my family. And I read God's Word every day. And I tried to make decisions based off of that. That is the light of Christ shining through you. And it glorifies your Father in heaven. Dear Lord, we just thank you for the study that we've had in your word. We thank you for the ability to shut out Satan and his ministers and the things of this world and just to focus on you and your word. Help us not to try to glamorize or sensationalize churchianity, but just to simply walk in the good works that you have ordained for us to walk in by reading your word every day, dying daily to the lust of the flesh, and then making decisions based upon that sound doctrine and what we've learned as we've read your word so that you are glorified in us rather than us in the flesh so that we walk in the spirit. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.